Hey everybody, I am here today with Roman Taito. He is the North American Export Director for George Dubuff Winery. Hi Roman, how are you? Hi Gabe, I'm very good at you. Doing well, doing well. So the Dubuff Winery is, is really well known worldwide. Uh, tell us something about the winery though that might surprise people. Ah, what might surprise you about Dubuff? Uh, we're uh, still family owned and operated. A lot of people have preconceived ideas about uh, Dubuff and think it's a, it's a big, big winery or that's probably owned by some um, you know, larger company, but it's still 100% family owned and operated. We have three generations of Dubuffs working at the winery right now. So maybe the most surprising is that we are a collection of, of small artisanal, artisanal uh, wineries at Dubuff. Okay, so that, that actually leads to my next question, which is tell us a bit more about the difference between the, the George Dubuff labeled wines and the Chateau wines. I think that's an area where a lot of people aren't quite so clear. It's, uh, so, so the way we, we label our wine in France is, uh, you know, you, put the, you would want to put the name of your brand on the label, uh, the village where it comes from, and then you can have add layers of complexity. At Dubuff, we want to have wines that are appellation based. So that's, for example, okay, let's look at this bottle here that we're gonna taste later, uh, Puy Fusé. So it says George Dubuff, that means that we selected wines to blend into that bottle, uh, Puy Fusé, which is the appellation. And for, so all the wines that we combine together, that we blend together, come from small, mom and pop wineries that have a very small production, but because we don't want to sell 200 different domains uh, from the same appellation, we're going to blend them together under uh, a, what we call a négociant label. But then out of these hundreds of small mom and pop winery that we work with, sometime we'll find a gem, uh, a domain that's so unique, so special in style, that we think it's worth bottling it separately. And that's what we call domains and chateaux. So domains and chateaux are small independent uh, vintners that grow the grape, make the wine and uh, bottle the wine. Sometimes we bottle it for them, but these are smaller operation, smaller production. And for them, because they have such a unique identity, we want their the name of their domain on the label. So for example, that's this one here. You'll see it says Domaine des Rosiers. So that's the name of the estate and Moulin Avant is the appellation. So within the, the region of Moulin Avant, there is one small uh, winemaker uh, here actually called Gérard Charvet who makes a smaller production and that we bottle separately. So that's the difference between négociant represented at Dubuff by the flowers on the label and domains and chateaus that are a smaller production. Great. Now, you know, you said uh, when you discover small gems and you feel that they, they should be represented by their own label mm -hmm. and, and you need to bottle them separately, uh, do those tend to stay a long time? In other words, um, are, are those, uh, once you've identified them, do you, uh, do you tend to have a long-term contract with them or are there times when you know, it happens to be a great vintage and you identify it for the vintage, but then a couple of vintages later, it, something has changed. But, so there's no rule, there's no rule, but when you identify a great winemaker and a good spot, a good, uh, a good place, then there is a higher chance that he will make, that person will make uh, great wines year after year. So for example, some of our, some of our flagship domains like uh, Morgon d'Escombes or Fleury Domaine des Quatre Vents, we've represented their wine for over 50 years under their own label. But sometimes we may, we may find, for example, in, in 2015, we introduced like new domains that we thought were outstanding and we decided to stop bottling them, uh, to, to stop blending them with other domains and starting bottling them under their own labels. Uh, but if for some reason, maybe it's a new winemaker or a change of generation 
and we're not so pleased with the with the style and the quality of the wine, then it will it will, will just stop purchasing it and it will lose their uh, their uh, domain chateau uh, label. So what you're what you're describing is something very flexible based on the changes uh, both at the wineries and just ch changes, I suppose, in agriculture and all the, all those sorts of things. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, one of the things that surprised me when I visited uh, Dubuff in the summer of 2018 that I wasn't expecting at all was the age worthiness of some of the wines, particularly some of the Gamays. I don't think that that's something people here in the United States realize very much. Is it something that people in Europe realize? Do, do people, whether it's in France or other parts of Europe, think of Beaujolais and Gamay specifically as wines that they, they may want to lay down and watch them evolve over time? I think the uh, misconception about Gamay's and Beaujolais is the same everywhere. Uh, people in America have the same preconceived ideas sometimes uh, as the French. So we're not better in that sense. Uh, we, we know a lot of that comes from Beaujolais Nouveau which was you know, a, a blessing and a curse at the same time because you know, it made Beaujolais famous, but also a lot of people think, thought that old Beaujolais is a nouveau wine, which means it needs to be uh, en enjoyed uh, in, its, in its first year or, or so. But, uh, and in the rest of the region that like, were reproduced wines like Cru Beaujolais was overshadowed by, by nouveau. Uh, but, now and for the last 10 years, people in the industry or consumers have really started to realize that uh, there in the southern part of Burgundy lies a region called Beaujolais, which makes amazing wine that, can, that you can lay down for, for years and years and that really get more and more interesting with age. So I think it's the same. We're at the same level in the U.S. or in France. And sometimes you know, now with you know, globalization, you can you kind of see the same trends uh, it can be in a restaurant in New York City or in Paris or in maybe in, uh, in Tokyo. They will really have the, the same trend. And, and now Beaujolais for the last 10 years, I think the entire region did a really good job at, at, uh, at promoting uh, the wines and, and talking especially about the crews of Beaujolais. Great. Uh, so that's interesting. So you're, you're kind of saying also that sort of... Uh, I think you didn't say these words, but maybe the advent of social media and uh, the web in general has helped the world become smaller and therefore that's where those trends maybe come from because people are sharing them, you know, all over the place. That's why the thing that is going on in Beaujolais may be known in a restaurant in New York City or maybe known in South Africa or somewhere else. Yeah, because tomorrow, let's say one of our producers is a... Uh is tweeting or is posting something on Instagram from his vineyard saying, okay, look, look what we're, for example, it's, it's, uh, uh, we're bottling the wine. We're bottling the wine at Domaine des Quatre Vents. The, the vineyard can, can take a picture and send it to, to Instagram and everywhere in the world, people can see what's happening. Uh, it's the same for the, for, for sommelier or influencers. They're, they're liking your wine and they're posting it on, uh, on the internet or you, know, you again, you go to Beaujolais and say, okay, look, I'm, I, I, I went to Beaujolais. I, di I didn't expect to taste a 40 years old Morgon and it's, it's mind blowing and you will influence people to, to, to get into trying that. So it's much quicker. You know, uh, it's a good thing because you know, we can actually change and, and the mentalities or, or work on the education uh, in another way and something more interactive. So you, the consumer gets closer to the producer. So that's one of the benefits of, uh, of technology in that sense. Agreed. Uh, you know, you mentioned change and I think, uh, you know, probably nobody changed Beaujolais more than George Dubuff. Everybody in the wine world uh, all over was saddened earlier this year when George passed away. It was such a, a pleasure to spend time with him when, when I was there and to, to taste wine at his house. Um, he, he had such an impact. Of course, 
uh, as you said, you know, the Nouveau craze seemed to um, overshadow Beaujolais for a while, but he, he's the one who basically created the, the Nouveau craze he, here in the U.S., and I think that's what a lot of people, as they knew Beaujolais for, they knew George for. Uh, what are some things about George that he did um, for the industry that maybe people don't realize, and perhaps some of them are even things that you didn't realize until you started working for Dubuff? You see, you see when you first know, I've, I've been uh, blessed to, to, to have been working for 10 years for uh, Georges Dubuff, what a gentleman and a great human being the most humble, uh, genuine, and nice person you, you can think of. No, not intimidating at all. He, I think he, he, he had the, the career he had because he was uh, honest and he loved what he did and he could really connect with people. Not, you know, just, just talking the same language as you and sharing his passion for, for wine. Simply as that. And... Uh, uh, one of the things I, I actually realized uh, is that he is very well respected in in the region, because he, when you're you know you cannot you cannot uh, build out of nothing a an empire or a, a big winery like like his without being uh, without being a someone honest and hardworking and have, having great relationships. Um, and because you can you can fool someone a, a vintner a, a winemaker in the vintage he will not want to work with you the, the year after you know George was able to to earn the trust of people in the region and to work with them for 50 or 60 years and that's because he was uh, loyal and uh, and honest and uh, and also always looking for for the for the best product and one thing uh, that surprised me when I started working for Georges Duboeuf is how people talked about him. They never say uh, uh, George. Nobody would say George. We would say Monsieur Duboeuf. Monsieur Duboeuf. He was Monsieur, and I see a, a Sir or Mister. He was, he's, a, mm -hmm. he's a sign of, uh, of uh, can I say, of respect. Yeah, great respect, yeah. Yeah, everybody, when you say you're talking about Monsieur Duboeuf, people knew... Uh, yeah, when, uh, I, when I visited and we went to the different chateaus, uh, you could see when his name came up, uh, the light in people's eyes just, you know, they were just so excited and so warm. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, you could tell that they not only respected him greatly as a businessman and a partner, but they, they loved him as a human being. Yeah, exactly. Gabe, you see, I, I was talking to, I think that was maybe a, a year before you, you came. So, so George, was, at the time, he was maybe 84, 85 years old. And I remember talking to a producer in, uh, in a little village in the south of Beaujolais, where we, where we produce Nouveau. And I talked to him and you say, he told me, um, he told me something. The, 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 the Sunday before, he was walking in his, in his vineyard. And he saw between rows of vines, he saw uh, two legs uh, lying on the floor. And he goes, uh, is, there, is there someone sleeping or, or lying down in, in, the, in the vineyard? And, and it was actually George Duboeuf on his back, taking picture with his iPhones of, uh, of, of vines, of gamay vines and, and gamay grapes right before the harvest. That's, was, that's incredible. He was passionate to the point to be at 85 years old, taking picture on a Sunday of grapes uh, for his personal collection. <laughs> That's that. amazing. Not, not for his Instagram account. <laughs> he, you, you'll be surprised. Like a lot of uh, yeah. pictures from our Instagram account were actually taken, were by, taken by George. Yeah, on his iPhone, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, that's, that's great. So... Um, Tell me a bit about George's, uh, you know, upbringing in Macon, and I think, uh, you know, we have a wine from that that region to taste as well. Yeah, exactly. So, so George uh, is you know very well known for Beaujolais, but for those of you who haven't been to um, to France, Beaujolais is actually the southern part of Burgundy, so you can consider it's a region on itself, but you can say also it's part of Greater Burgundy. 
uh, if you go north of Beaujolais, just a, a couple of miles north of Beaujolais, you're in the beginning of a region called Maconay. So Maconay is, is well known for uh, Macon village, but also for a uh, wonderful crew called Puy Fusse, and that's where Georges Duboeuf was born in 1933, so in Puy Fusse, uh, France. And he grew up in a family of winemakers that had been doing wine, making wine for over 400 years. And usually, you know, when we say 400 years, is just because we don't know when they started. For maybe they've been doing that for a thousand years. Uh, but the Duboeuf family, the first records of the family name is uh, yeah, from the 1600s. So is before, it, wow. uh, is it before yeah. Mayflower? Or <laughs> oh yeah, for sure, yeah, that was 1692. Yeah, so that's before they were already making wine in Puy Fusse. And George, uh, when he was a kid actually, was working in the vineyard. And at the time, you must imagine when you were... Um, working in vineyard, it's like you, if you were like a farm boy, you no, know? you had to know how to do everything. You, you were multitasking, you know, you had to take care of the, uh, the, the pigs and the cattle and, and work uh, some um, vegetables in the, in, in the garden, but also working in the vineyard, you had to do everything. For example, at the time, um, George told me one day that at the time, you no, know, they had no electricity. So, when it was too warm during winemaking, and you, you don't want it to be too warm when you're making white wine, actually. So uh, he had to take his bike to the, to the nearest town of uh, Macon to buy blocks of ice and bring it back to the winery just to wrap around the, the, the tank or the vat during, during uh, fermentation, okay. just to cool down, to cool the, down yeah. the, the process. So he was doing actually everything at, at the winery and he was just passionate. So he restarted making wine by working in his family estate, but he could have done like his brother. His older brother stayed at the, the family property his entire life. And George uh, had uh, such a personality and, an, and a vision that it was just too small for himself. And he had to go um, to to other appellation and he wanted to share his love of wine with the the rest of the world. Terrific. Uh, you know, that, that came across because he sort of uh, uh, taught the world so much about wine in a lot of ways. He, uh, he reminds me of an American a little bit. Um, I think he and, uh, I don't know if he and Robert Mondavi ever met. I assume they did at some point, but I think Mandavi, who was a visionary of Napa Valley, and George, who's a, a visionary of Beaujolais and, and France, I think both uh, did a lot for the wine industry. So I think there's some parallels there. Yeah, they, I think they met. They must have met. George uh, uh, went to Napa a few, a few times. He always, actually, he always wanted to meet when, when I was uh, traveling in the U.S. He always asked me to bring samples from, uh, from California. Because he, he loved to taste wines from all over the world. And, you know, when you're in France, we're sometimes we're a little narrow-minded narrow and, and patriotic. We only find wines from France and especially wines from the region. But you, you go to Bordeaux and, and try to find a Burgundy in Bordeaux, you know, good, good luck with that. You know? <laughs> it's, I, I think that's a European trait, maybe yeah. more just a French trait because I, I, you know, you hear that in other countries of Europe too, that they, they drink local, they drink their own country, but they even drink closer tie, tied in their own country. They drink their own region. Yeah. It's, it's very, very local. And so it's very hard for us to, to find, to find wines uh, from outside of France or Europe. So I was bringing back wines from California and then Oregon and Washington state or even New York state. And he always enjoyed it. And then sometimes I could bring back some uh, Oregon Gamay, for example, and we we're just making sure we we're still making the best Gamay in the world. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. So uh, should we drink some wine? Okay, sure. So let's start where George started in Puy Fusse. Okay, I've got one here too. And 2018, actually, I think you contributed to that uh, vintage uh, game because you... You, you, you hiked to the top of the rock of Solutre. I, I did. I think about that 
that morning, early afternoon, often that was a, just a beautiful, um, a beautiful spot, particularly beautiful within a beautiful region. It was just a, a highlight of that trip. It's actually, I went back a week ago to the Rock of Solutre. So, so the Rock of Solutre is actually a big rock of limestone. It's very scenic, it's beautiful. And it's quite a, a hike to go to the top, especially when it's, it's, uh, it's warm because it's, it's, it's just pure limestone. So it reflects the sun and can be real, uh, really, really warm at the top of the rock. But it's, when you're at the top of the rock, you can see the entire region. And that's where you understand why Puy Fusse is so special because of that soil and also because of the way it is set up. It's a, what we call an amphitheater. Uh, so it's, it's a place where really the, the Chardonnay can have uh, this full maturity and also a great expression of the limestone in the soil. So I was there actually a, a week ago when we were first allowed to leave our, uh, our, our house okay. uh, after lockdown in France. I went with my family to have a little picnic at the bottom of the Rock of Solutre and I found like lots of, of fossilized oysters in the soil. You didn't have to look, to, to, to search too much. You can just look at the ground. It's just full of small size uh, oysters that are millions of years old. And that's what the, the terroir in Puy Fusse is. And that's very unique to that place uh, in Puy Fusse. So you can actually, ref in, in the wine, you can really get that uh, minerality. It's a very overused word, but I think you really get it in Puy Fusse. So, um, so you see that it's a, it's a golden, it's a pale golden color. You have aromas, I don't know if you agree, but you have like, like uh, citrus notes, uh, little lemon, apple and pear, a touch of, uh, a touch of toasted almonds. I agree, yeah, the, the apple and pear are pretty prominent. Uh, what I really love here is, um, is sort of that uh, sour green apple, and um, which comes towards the back. There's a little brighter sort of yellow apple at the front, but the tension between the fruit and the acidity, um, it's rich, but it's, uh, it's so crisp, and it's such a food-friendly wine, you could just keep drinking. Yeah, see, it's, it's, uh, it's you, you see, the, uh, in France, you, know, you want rich wine, but you know, you're um, like old money. You know, see, uh, you want to be rich, but not too opulent. You don't show it too much. No, it's, it's more balanced. Yeah. You want to have some austerity as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the acidity is key in Puy Fusse. As you know, the, the, the vintages are getting warmer and warmer uh, with uh, climate change. Uh, a lot of a lot of vintage, you know, it's 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 a struggle to keep the acidity. So, being a negociant, we are able to redirect our um, search for wines in places that are that that are able to keep this acidity. And it's uh, it can be either by choosing uh, vineyards that are that are a little higher in elevation or, or that are uh, western uh, that are, have um, exposure. That is not just south facing, but that's more west facing, or that sees a little less of sun and it keeps tension and, and acidity. So a wine, a wine like this that is certainly, you know, I think in, in the hand, fair to say one of the handful of flagship wines in the lineup. Uh, and, you know, you say, you know, you source from different vineyards. Mm -hmm. How much does that, the vineyards that go into this particular wine change from year to year? Are there sort of, uh, vineyards that nearly always go in there and on the fluctuate or does it really change dramatically each year no it we, we will keep a uh, the relationship and the, the style so the, the people we work with know which style we're looking for and that style can evolve depending on you know now because it's the the, the next generation Frank Duboeuf uh, uh, is in charge and he brings his own personality to the, the choice in, um, in wine purchasing. Uh, and, and so, but they know, the people we work with know what we are looking for. 
uh, they know what the Dubuff style is, and we're looking for fruit and balance and tension, you see? Uh, so they know what we're looking for, and depending on, on, on because they, you know, for years they've submitted samples to us, and we always selected just a few samples. So they know what we like and they tend to try to find ones that are uh, in our taste. But it doesn't mean that we're, the, the style will always be the same. You know, we can always uh, mm -hmm. change a little bit. Well, as, as you said also, you know, the climate changes. So of course, as there's more heat and you might get a little more alcohol and, and ripeness, you may adjust because of that because you have to, tweak things a little bit, your style, because of the way things have changed, I imagine. Yes, you, you, we have to, um, actually bring some, sometimes you can bring good things, you know, look, look at the, the reds, you know, the, look at the last 10 years, it's excellent vintage after excellent vintage. It's so, I mean, it, we haven't had a bad year in, in very long time in Beaujolais, but the style is evolving as well as we're uh, finding reds that are, no, we're drinking white, but I'm talking about the reds. But uh, right. now we can see the change in the reds. In the white, we can always adjust by uh, the way we work the Chardonnay and the way we uh, we also purchase. You have the um, have the picking choices had to change because of climate. Have, have you had to pick you know much earlier than you would have yeah. ten years ago? Yeah, yeah, we uh, we harvest uh, we harvest much earlier. Uh, now we are the 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 harvest, the the harvest is more in in August. Now, if you mm -hmm. you ask even people that are in their forties, they would say when they were kids in Beaujolais, they remember the harvest could that could be in October. Now it's uh, in in August. Um, and Chardonnay, for example, this this year, Chardonnay, the flowering of Chardonnay uh, was a week earlier than last year, which, which was already early. Uh, wow. So, you know, it's it's a fact that it's 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 really changing. You know, if you look back at medieval uh, medieval books about there is a, a I'd say a zodiac book or a, a calendar from the medieval times uh, in France mm -hmm. and you can see uh, October be, being the the months of the harvest no it never happens anymore you know the latest harvest we had lately was end of September but it was very unusual wow yeah that, that's it's amazing it's amazing it's really incredible how quickly things things are changing that that's I think what's I find most mind-blowing yeah, maybe we're gonna do blue agave and tequila in a in a few in a few years. <laughs> yeah, well, you, know, you have to wait uh, se seven years. Okay, agave before you can harvest it. To, to, okay. To get so we should tequila. better get started now. Yeah. You better get started now. Yeah. <laughs> so shall we move over to a red? Sure. So that if you say uh, if you oh, yeah. want to pair it with maybe. We could have uh, lobster or fish with white sauce, something, something a little creamy. Maybe if you want to go chicken with creme fraiche and morels. So that's very good. That's a very good choice. So it's really a, um, a beautiful white wine, white Chardonnay, very elegant, that uh, can really go well with a food that's a little, uh, a little rich. Uh, could go what sort well of cheese would you pair it with? What sort of cheese? Ooh, some very like cow milk, a little rich and creamy. Uh, maybe like uh, I don't know, like a, uh, a du, du triple creme or <laughs> oh, yeah. something oh, yeah. like that. But yeah, yeah that sounds great. Um, um, for example. Yeah, no, that sounds very good. Yeah, and that's it's it's a really lovely example. Of Chardonnay, really love it. The the acidity really speaks to me. I think, as with a lot of people, uh, the more wine I drink over the years, the more I, I chase acid. Yeah, like uh, Jerry Garcia. Huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> different you, kind of acid. You can cut. You can cut that one again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, <laughs> That's funny. 
<laughs> okay, sorry, Gabe. Um, yeah, you want to yeah. move to, to the Reds? Yeah, you want to move to the Reds? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so let's go south. So we were in Puy Fusé. We go okay. south, south to, uh, to Beaujolais. And we're going to start with our flagship Beaujolais. That's Beaujolais Village. So I love that label. It was made by George Buff, picked by George Buff. The three flowers of the French flag, which I happen to be the same as, as, your, uh, as your flag as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Beaujolais Village is the one that you will have, um, that, that you will find the, the, the most easily um, in your local store. Beaujolais Village can be sourced anywhere between 38 villages in Beaujolais. And when you look at Beaujolais, Beaujolais is going to be approximately the size of Napa, so 30 miles, 30 miles south to north, about, about 10 miles wide. And in the south, you'll find Beaujolais. You go up Beaujolais Village, that's kind of the middle tier, where you get fruit as Beaujolais, but more complexity, more, uh, more tannins as well more structure, and the top tier will be a Cru Beaujolais. So Beaujolais Village is really a great uh, middle tier, a great introduction to French wine in general, or uh, to, to, to Beaujolais for sure. And doing this wine here, we're going to really, really, really um, do a great negociant work because being able to be consistent in quality and style is very, very hard. And with Beaujolais Village, it's, it's hours and hours of tasting, of blending, and, and it's very complicated to make a Beaujolais Village. Uh, so let's see if it's good. You want to try that? Yes, please. Okay, I didn't pour myself a glass. So, so on the nose, it's always... Um, Predominantly a fr a fruit, like a fresh, fresh fruit basket. You, you can find red and black fruits. Here in 2018, you get a little bit more uh, black fruits than usual, maybe a, uh, a little bit of black cherry, but you can also find like uh, strawberries, um, raspberries. It's, it's like a fresh basket of fruit for me, uh, Beaujolais Village. And that's what I love about this one. It's so aromatic and, and pleasant. I agree with you. Um, all that fresh uh, fruit, you, you're definitely leaning black, this, this vintage, and um, great, great acidity again. But I like how on the back, the fruits turn tart. You know, you've yep. got that fresh fruit up front, but that tartness on the finish is just, um, it, it makes me want to go back for another sip. Exactly. That's what you do, actually. That's, that's the, the goal. And really think of these wines as, as food companions. You know, a lot of time, you people in the industry, you know, we would taste 500 wines and give ratings and, and not having any food. With this one here, I want to just take my time, sip it slightly chilled and have food with that. Maybe uh, uh, simple food like cheese and charcuterie, maybe you know, burgers, uh, because this acidity really makes you want to eat with that. And so the goal in, in, in I would say French in general, but at Dubuff especially, we want to make wine that makes food better, uh, taste better, and the, the food will make the wine taste better. So that's what you know, Beaujolais Village is all about. It's uh, uh, versatility, uh, great food pairing, and also... Um, Deliciousness. That's the word George always used to say. Deliciousness. Uh, deliciousness. He was saying gourmand. So I was making all the, the, the translation of uh, oh, okay. notes. And he always yeah. used the word gourmand. And gourmand doesn't have an exact translation in English. But mm -hmm. it's, it may, the, the, the general meaning of gourmand is that it makes you want to eat and go for more. Yeah. No, that's fair. Um, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, food and you mentioned uh, chilling this wine a little bit. So it makes me think here in the U.S., right now we're at the very beginning um, of grilling season, you know, in the summertime, basically between Memorial Day and Labor Day, which is 
uh, the, the end of May and the beginning of September is when people are outside more and they grill more, especially, I mean, all over the country, but especially in the, in the eastern part of the country. And this is a perfect barbecue wine. Mm. You, know, you have a couple of bottles, just drop them in ice for a little bit. And like you said, a burger, ribs, even hot dogs. This is, or if you're just hanging out on your porch mm. and, and having a glass of wine with your friend or your wife or your husband, it's great. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, and um, that, that's it. Uh, sometimes we drink our wines, our reds, too, too warm and our whites too cold. So it's, that's especially true when you see Puy Fusé, you don't want it too chilled because actually you're going to lose a lot of that complexity. And Beaujolais Village, if it's too warm, it's going to be not as interesting as, as when it's, it's, it's fresh. So put it maybe, as you say, in a nice bucket for a couple, a few minutes or throw it in the fridge for 20 minutes just to bring down the temperature and it will just be better. If it's too cold to your taste, just wait. It will work. Exactly. Eventually. Yeah, no, I always do the same thing with white wines because even in restaurants here, they're often, often served too cold and I just let them sit because they, they seem very uh, closed off mm -hmm. and just a couple more degrees warmer on the whites and they just, they open up like a flower. Yeah, exactly. Oh, perfect, uh, uh, perfect uh, example. So that Beaujolais village, yeah, really our bistro wines, bistro wine. Whenever we are able to go back to to, to bistros again, uh, you see, go to Paris, you will always find a Beaujolais uh, on the wine list, because when you hire a new waiter as a restaurant manager. And there is a new, a new kid who doesn't know nothing about wine and, and is there at uh, the center of the stage when a couple asks for a recommendation about wine, he has no clue what to, to, to say. We, will say. we always tell him, go with Beaujolais, you cannot go wrong. Beaujolais, it's so versatile. If you're having uh, anything, it's... it's it's gonna be. A, it could be a, a good pairing. It's pretty easy to recommend. So Beaujolais, it's simple. It's but it, it's it's great. Okay. So two questions about this wine specifically. Yep. Um, one, um, you know, I see it's this vintage, ninety thousand cases. Does that change dramatically, or, and or is that in a growing phase, or has it been pretty consistently around ninety cases now for a while? Uh, that's the first. And the second is, um, I know at a $14 wine in the US, it's not meant to be an aging wine, but how many years do you think a wine like this is drinkable in your opinion? So uh, that number, because you know, we, we have to put a number, but that's a number that's for the entire production. So that's not only what is exported to the US, that is something that's what goes to, to other places in the world, like, mm -hmm. like Japan or uh, other places in Europe and even France. So that overall number doesn't reflect what you have in your bottle. What you have in your bottle is a special cuvee we make uh, for the US because we take into account the, the style and, and what each market likes. So that's what, not a giant big cuvee that, goes, that, that is uh, done for the whole world. We have a lot of smaller batch, smaller uh, cuvee that we, we make throughout the year just to have the freshest wine and the most um, balanced and the, 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 the most suitable for each market because the whole world has different tastes. So 90,000 cases, you know, it's more or less going to be the same year after year. Some years we have less because of weather condition, for example, and we're not able to, to, to do as much. For example, 2019 was a smaller vintage, uh, and sometimes we were able to do uh, to do the full range of, of the capacity. And your uh, second question, uh, if you can remind me, <laughs> your second. Oh yeah, no. So so I know it's not intended to to uh, to age uh, with the acidity that this wine has, hmm. the freshness it has. I would think that certainly it's it's going to be delicious in four or five years. Of course, of course, and you you answer the question. You know, the key that it has the alcohol and the and the acidity and the structure, 
but it's balanced. It's not. It's not too. It's not too too much acid, too much alcohol. Uh, it's it's just perfect. It's a perfect balance, and they also have the 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 tannic band backbone behind it. So this, to me, it it drinks like a crew, Beaujolais. Right? In 2018, it drinks like a crew. Et, but it's still a, a Beaujolais village. It it does have a surprising amount of tannin, um, and I mean that in a good way for a fourteen dollar wine. There's just more structure there than you normally get for that price. Yeah, it's a it's an incredible price quality ratio, and you see, I'm not just saying that because it's my job to sell this wine. But sometimes when I'm I'm uh, I'm on the road showing uh, 12, let's say 12 of my wines, and at the end of the day, I'm I'm with the um, the the person I was working with, and we decide to have a glass of wine. Very often, I choose Beaujolais Village, mm. not the the fanciest crew Beaujolais. Because I think it's it's fantastic. It's it's really a fantastic bottle of wine, and it, it, there's much more work that goes into making a Beaujolais village than a more prestigious um, appellation. It's very hard to make a, a great wine for fourteen dollars. That makes sense, also because I think of the quantity, and when you're selling that much wine, uh, um, you're also people are more so expecting. Um, a specific style year after year with, within a window. Whereas with a, a single vineyard wine, you know, you're going to, you have the opportunity to let the, the vineyard specific vineyard speak a bit more. Exactly. Exactly. It's, uh, it's the art of blending. It's the art of blending. You want to make one plus one equals three. That's the, that's what yeah. you're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's lovely. So um, I think we have one more wine. Should we uh, taste that one? So we were in Beaujolais village and we were going to head north to Cru of uh, to the Cru region of Beaujolais. So we have 10 crews in Beaujolais and perhaps one of the very, the very best or the most famous of the crews is called Moulin Avant. And Moulin Avant means the windmill. Moulin Avant, yeah, it's the windmill. So maybe you uh, you seen the windmill? I think you did. I did. We we, vi we visited. Yes, it's an old windmill that's over maybe five hundred years old, and that's standing in the middle of the appellation. So the the, the village of oh no, so the appellation of Moulin Avant is spread across two villages. South is Romanèche, where our winery is, and to the to the northwest is Chena. Which is also a crew, but in between the two, these two uh, villages lies the appellation Moulin Avant, and it's so unique, perhaps because of the soil in uh, Moulin Avant. You have a lot of granite, like in most places in Cru Beaujolais, but also you have uh, manganese, which is a big black rock that you only mm -hmm. find in Moulin Avant, and we think it's it's perhaps what gives this characteristic to to the wine. So I'm, as I'm pouring the wine, I right away I noticed how darker it is. It's, yeah, you cannot see through your glass. Yeah, that's Moulin Avant. Uh, you, cannot, you really cannot see through the glass. It's very dark. It's, uh, it's a pitch, yeah. pitch black, uh, what do you say? Uh, very dark color. It's on the nose, there are so many descriptions. Yeah, and a lot of times, you see you don't it know. Yeah. comparatively, if you could tell. But yeah, it's definitely much darker. Much darker. It's really here. It's the king of Beaujolais. Uh, he will has he will have more structure, more depth, more complexity. And you get this uh, still this black black fruits, black berries. Um, but also notes of spice, faded roses. For for all its darkness, it's it's still quite aromatic. Mm -hmm. And I feel that the nose almost belies the palate because um, the aromas are a bit lighter than the palate. You still get. Um, 
these light smells. And it, um, then when you take that first sip, the darkness of the fruit um, is a little bit of a surprise. Exactly. And you, you also get a, a touch of oak uh, aging here. So we age about 15% of the, of, uh, the wine in uh, French oak. Not, uh, not only new oak, it's a combination of uh, new and old barrels of French barrels. It's aged at the estate. But here you really see like the, the potential of Gamay. It's, it's the same grape as Beaujolais Nouveau, but it's very different. It's very different uh, in style. Uh, it's like, it's, it's not the, I mean, it's the two, of the, the two sides of the spectrum. Uh, here you're really looking for structure, den uh, density, ageability, complexity. Uh, and that one can age for 50 years, can compare to very fine burgundies. It's, it's something that I would buy a case of and open the bottle every two years to see how it evolves. Yeah, absolutely. And this is one of the chateaus I recall when I visited in 2018 that we did taste some older vintages and um, just uh, really a revelation. I think, uh, I think we tasted 95 or 96, if I recall correctly. And the freshness that those wines were still exhibiting was uh, really an eye-opening moment for me. And it's made by a wonderful man called Gérard Charvet. Uh, Gérard Charvet uh, is a passionate winemaker. He's a very funny, uh, f funny person too. And he, he always, um, he always try to, 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 I mean, no matter how much he makes, he wants to make the very best possible wine. He's a kind of a risk taker in a sense because he, he will, wait a few more days where uh, whereas uh, his, his neighbors are going to, to to rush and harvest to to mm -hmm. make the maximum yield he will wait the last minute just to get this extra density and ripeness and also in the winemaking he will he will push it longer he will make a you know, longer winemaking trying to extract a bit more so we'll take a bit more risk and Jean, um, I mean, Gérard told me a story one day. He was uh, in, his, in his cellar, which is very, very small cellar, maybe uh, uh, 10 small tanks for winemaking. And uh, George Duboeuf came to, to taste each tank. So he tasted like that. And then he came back the week after. And in between the, uh, the two Sundays, uh, Gérard had moved a tank to another place. So he had basically shuffled the tank and George came back and, and, and Gerard said nothing and George taste and he goes just from memory, not taking notes, he said, okay, that tank over there, he was there. So number one was number four and number five was where number nine is now. And he had remember every single cuvee he tasted without taking notes within one week. That was very impressive. <laughs> I'd say, yeah. Th this wine, while it's uh, certainly delicious now, I really, I would, I would start drinking this in maybe four or five years. Hmm. I think that um, it's, a, it's a baby. Exactly. Exactly. It needs time. It needs time. You can, you, you can still think it's, it's, at, it's at the beginning. It needs... More, more time and you you should be able in the u.s to find some vintages like so we're in 2020 now and and you can find maybe a, a 2015 in your local store uh which should taste uh fantastic right now so i always invite you people like if you're if you're shopping that budget is really a, a region where you can you can find some older vintages in, in some wine shops for a very reasonable price and be extremely surprised by the quality of the wine. Well, that, that's the other thing that, um, I don't want to say it was a surprise, but it's sort of, because um, I knew the prices of Beaujolais before visiting, because I'd been drinking some, but it, it sort of underscored it. This is one of the top end wines right here, mm -hmm. and it's a $40 wine in the US. 
I mean, $40 is, is not that much money for a bottle of wine of this quality. And I think that's kind of true of Beaujolais um, in general, that you, you get so much bang for the buck. Yeah, it's a uh, it's great price quality ratio, wine that you can enjoy in almost every, every day. Yeah. Why not uh, do it? So. Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, you go back to, to the villages, I mean, for 14 bucks, I mean, that's kind of around $15 is what, a lot, what you hear a lot of people say they want to spend on their wine for Tuesday night with tacos or pizza or whatever they're having. So, uh, and that would go well with both of those things. <laughs> so let's do Beaujolais Tuesday. Then. <laughs> Beaujolais Tuesday, yeah, exactly. That works for me. So uh, what is going on? Wine-wise, in, in 2020 with Dubuff, is there anything new or exciting that we should be aware of? So, I think what's so, so it started very on the bad foot with the the passing of of, uh, of George, but now yes. uh, the next generation is in full force, and Frank really has as uh, is really showing his his own personality. I think it's very interesting. We have a new, also for the last two years, we have a new uh, analogist or, or head purchaser at Duboeuf. There was also a, a change uh, of generation there. And these two are uh, Frank and uh, Emmerich, our uh, analogist. These two are getting, getting along very well. They have very good taste and they are shifting slowly so it's evolution not a revolution but it's an evolution in the style of debuff and i think it's really going in the in the right direction there are also the third generation of the debuff family uh, with aurelien debuff who is uh, 20 years old who's passionate about winemaking with is uh, actually worked on the on, on beaujolais nouveau last year and on the, the making of the whites as well and he's uh he's involved in in, in in remodeling one of our vineyards in Puy Fusay. So we're retrying really also new things that, like the winery, the vineyard that we own around the winery is converting to organic. Um, so we're, we're working in a lot of new projects and I think the quality will only get better uh, with time. So that's something that's very exciting. So, you know, you've sort of referenced it a couple of times that the differences between uh, Frank and his father, George, uh, how, how would you characterize the differences stylistically? Uh, you know, is it specifically about what they care for wine wise, where their palates are? What are the biggest uh, differences in uh, Frank versus George running the company? Um, so they have very different personality, but they there sometimes you are looking at them and you can see george dubuff uh <laughs> you can see george dubuff maybe 30 years ago or yeah. uh, they are very similar and i remember doing trips uh with them the two and it was just so heartwarming to see the the father-son relationship they had it was just uh, just fantastic. So there, Frank has, is very similar to his to his uh, to his father in the way he thinks, the way he works, the way he treats people as well. Um, so it's not night and day. You know, sometimes the in this family company, uh, the new generation comes and wants to turn the table and then to restart everything. Here is not the case. Uh, he's really He's really taking uh, his father's legacy with a lot of respect and trying to continue the work of his father in the same spirit of what he built. And I think it's very respectful for everyone that have been uh, involved in, uh, in, in, with the George Dubuff uh, family. So I don't think it's going to change uh, overnight but he will continue to evolve slowly with, uh, the, with, with Frank. Um, and I've loved working for the both of them for the, for the last 10 years, and I'm happy to continue uh, with Frank and now the, the, the next generation. That's great. I mean, I think uh, slow change is really the more natural change. And I think you 
usually get better results that way. Oftentimes, unless it's a bad situation, which obviously you guys are not, um, making dramatic changes usually uh, kind of, I don't know, it's kind of like an earthquake, right? Yeah. That, that slow little move, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Hmm. Exactly. Well, thank you very much, Ramon. I appreciate well, this. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you so much. Cheers. Sante, cheers. Cheers. I, I look forward to when we can clink our glasses together. Okay. <laughs> okay.